Hi everybody and welcome to chapter 4 on sensation and perception. So for today's objectives, we are going to evaluate the influences of nature and nurture on behavior. And I don't know why these are out of order, my apologies. We are also going to define and describe key concepts and theories in the field of psychology. So the nature nurture thing is just kind of something that we see throughout this textbook as a recurring theme. We see that as a recurring theme just in the field of psychology in general. Then for our outline, we are going to define sensation and perception. We are going to talk about vision. So we're going to look at features and functions of the eye. We're going to talk about theories of color vision and discuss depth perception. And then we are going to define general terms related to detecting stimuli and processing info. And we are going to spend the rest of the time talking about hearing and a couple of, um, a couple of other senses. So we're going to talk about olfaction and gustation. So we're going to spend the most time talking about vision and then slightly less time talking about hearing. And then the rest of the time is just going to kind of be a hodgepodge of other terms and concepts. All right. So what is sensation? So we talk about sensation in chapter seven on memory. Uh, so what is it? Sensation is just stimulation of the sense organs. So we have the five basic senses, right? We have uh, sight, vision, touch, taste, and smell. So all of the receptors that we have on our bodies to detect different types of stimuli, it's just sensation is information we gather from those sensory organs. And then what is perception? All right, so perception is how we select, organize, and interpret sensory information. So all of that raw data that we get from our sensory organs, we then start to make sense of it. <laughs> we start to put all of that information together. So it's how we choose the information that we pay attention to. Again, going to the chapter on memory. If we don't pay attention to something, then we don't hold on to it. Uh, so what... We're, we're constantly getting information from our senses. We're constantly, um, you know, depending on your abilities, we're either seeing things, we're hearing things, we're touching things, we're feeling things, we're tasting things, smelling things. So all of this information is coming at us and perception is what we choose to actually pay attention to and then how we put information together. All right, so for instance, like experiencing what a rose is. You may smell it, you may see the petals, see the color, see the thorns on it. So you take different information from uh, sensory organs and you put it all together to, to determine what it is that you're seeing or what it is that you are experiencing. All right, so first up we have the visual system. So we're going to talk about the eye. So we're gonna talk about the eye, color vision, and depth perception in this section. So here is a, a pretty rudimentary, but very uh, descriptive, informative diagram of the eye. So first up, we have the cornea here. So this like layer outside of our eye. So the cornea is a transparent covering that focuses light that enters the eye. So it starts to already, as soon as light enters our eye, it starts to filter it and, and start to um, kind of um, make it manageable so that our eye can figure out, you know, what it is that we are detecting. Then we have the pupil. So the pupil is uh, the dark, almost black area in the center of our eyes. It regulates the amount of light that enters the eye. So if you get a lot of light coming into your eyes, the pupil typically constricts. It gets really small. Um, if, it, if you are in a low light situation, then your pupil usually gets really big to try to let in as much light as possible because there's not, avail uh, not much available. So it tries to let in what little light is there. I always joke that I have eyes like a cat because cats' pupils like get really big, like if they're like excited or if they're about to attack something. Um, and I have pupils that just kind of stay big. Um, 
but that is something that I've been told. I'm really not sure how accurate this is, um, but I've been told that that's something that's fairly common for folks with blue eyes or just light eyes in general. So who knows? The iris is the colored portion of the eye. So the iris um, here, it has like these little lines that fan out. Looks almost like if you were to uh, rotate this, it would look like like a diagram of like a rising sun. Uh, so the iris is just the colored portion of the eye. And then the lens is back here. The lens focuses light falling onto the retina. So kind of like the brain, how we have structures that do the same or similar things, we've got some overlapping functions of the eye. So we've got the cornea doing the roughest form of light filtering. We've got the pupil either, even further limiting or allowing light to enter the eye. And then we have the lens that does even more fine tuning and starts to focus the light that falls back to the retina, which is the lining back here. More about that in just a second. All right, so we've got the same diagram of the eye. I just, you know, tried to get fancy with my illustration and I moved it to the left side of the screen. Uh, so the retina. The retina, again, is this lining back here. It absorbs light. It also starts to process images and it sends visual information to the brain. So we've got the fovea here, which is this little like divot in the retina. So the retina is this whole lining back here this whole thing. So the fovea is just like a little divot within the retina and it's a section that contains cones. So what do cones do? Cones are cells that are specialized at, at processing color stimuli. So it processes color vision. Then we have the optic nerve, which is back here, and it sends information from the retina to the brain. So again, the retina gets, you know, these other structures up here at the front of the eye, they all start to do some, some rough and then finer and finer tuning. And then the retina makes sense of all of the information that filtered through. Uh, fovea helps us, you know, figure out if we've detected color in the objects that we're observing or not. And then the retina sends information to the brain via the optic nerve. The optic nerve, you don't have to memorize really any of this, but this is just to serve as like a demonstration of what's happening. So as you might recall from the chapter on biopsych, we have um, the, the back part of our brain, the occipital lobe, is the part of the brain that is most specialized and the fastest at putting together visual stimuli. And... You might also recall that I've said that's kind of counterintuitive because the eyes are at the front of our heads and then the, the occipital lobe is way in the back. Um, but here you can see a diagram of how it's wired. So we've got the optic nerve that is going from the back of our eyeballs and it is wired to the back of the brain. So it sends information. Um, but it doesn't go straight back. It does kind of loop through several sections of the brain. So it goes through the midbrain. It goes through the thalamus. So the midbrain just being a brain area. And then the thalamus being a specific brain structure. Again, you may recall that the thalamus, when we've talked about it, is often just kind of um, referred to or described as a general relay center. So it starts to make sense and put together sensory input. So anything that we gather from our senses, not just from our eyes. So that is the way that it is routed. So um, we've got we've got nerves on both sides of our eyes. So it kind of converges to create just one nerve. And we've got all kinds of like intricate wiring happening. So we've got different parts of the brain that are actually involved in processing visual stimuli. All right, so now on to color vision. So again, going back to the cones in the, that the fovea houses cones. So the fovea is a section of the retina that has cones, which are specialized cells. And again, those detect color. So we've got the trichromatic theory of color vision, which says that we have three types of receptors or cones that each detect different wavelengths. So they're 
each specialized for different colors. So the wavelengths are associated with three primary colors, um, which are different than the three primary colors that we think of when we think of like art. Uh, you learn about uh, yellow, red, and blue being the primary colors. In this case, it is not, and I will show you those in just a moment. Uh, but all colors can be perceived by mixing primary colors. So again, not the ones that you typically think of, not like the Pixar primary colors, the little Pixar ball that is blue, red, and yellow. So what are the primary colors? They are red, blue, and green. So this is not going against what we've learned all our lives about primary colors. This just means that for color vision, we've got a different set. Um, but this is not very intuitive. Like it doesn't necessarily make sense at the surface level because what do you get when you mix red and blue? You get purple. What do you mix when you, what do you get when you mix blue and green? Blue, green. <laughs> um, but where does yellow come in? Where does orange come in? So this theory of color vision is lacking a little bit. Um, but it does explain um, it does explain color blindness. So folks who are colorblind typically have an issue with one or more of the types of cones in their eyes. So they either have an issue um, with the red ones, blue ones, or green ones. Uh, a lot of times people have issues with both red and green. And the issue is usually that they just see like shades of like gray or brown or like grayish brown and then it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, between red and green. Um, it's not as common for people to have a, a problem with the color blue or related colors. All right, so this is really hard to do, um, especially if you're viewing this lecture video from a phone, but Try, if you can, to stare at this image for 10 seconds and then close your eyes. So stare at it for 10 seconds, then close your eyes. And what happens? So what should happen um, under the right circumstances is you will see um, kind of almost like an x-ray vision of this, except that it's not in just black and white you'll see a different set of colors. So what is green here should look red to you. What is black here should look white to you. What is yellow here should look blue. And this little tiny white circle should look black. So this explains the other theory of color vision, the opponent process theory. So as I mentioned, there's kind of a problem, right? So this, this color wheel that I have, this is a color wheel from like art. And this gives us the primary colors that we've learned about our life, like our whole lives. Yellow up here, blue over here, red over here, and then mixing these colors or diluting them a little bit with white or, you know, tinting them darker with black will give us basically all of the colors that we would ever need. Um, and the last theory of color vision didn't really account for that. So now we have the opponent process theory, which says that receptors make antagonistic or like opposite responses to three color pairs. So as we saw in that flag, we have black and white, we have red and green, and we have yellow and blue. So which theory is correct? So basically opponent process theory says that the receptors, you know, make that decision, black, white, red, green, yellow, blue. But does this one really take into account the other colors on the color wheel either? So which one do you think sounds the most right? Well, my dears, in this class, as well as in life in general, a lot of times the answer is both or neither. Um, but in this case, it's both. Both are important at different levels of processing. So 
these two processes don't work counter to each other. They're not opposing ideas, even though this is opponent process theory. They're not against each other. They work together. Excuse me, I have like this ugh, tickle in my throat. <laughs> um, but they work together. So they both happen to be correct at just different stages of processing. All right, now on to depth perception. What is depth perception? What does it help us do? These two questions are kind of redundant. They're not meant to be two separate questions. They're meant to just kind of get to the heart of what depth perception is. So depth perception is interpretation of visual cues that indicate how near or far away objects are. So that is what depth perception is. What it helps us do is detect depth <laughs> or, <coughs> excuse me, perceive depth. So kind of like obvious, right? Um, but yeah, so it helps us determine like if we're driving a car, how near or far the car in front of us is. So it helps us know like when to brake, when to accelerate. If you are at all athletically inclined, which I am not, it helps you do things like throw a ball to know how far you need to go to reach your target. Um, now, just, just because you can perceive depth doesn't necessarily mean that you will get the ball there, but it does, depth perception definitely comes into play. We have different types of cues that help us. So we have monocular cues, which are cues that come from one eye at a time. And then we also have binocular cues, which we have to use both eyes to, um, to figure out um, depth. So when it comes to like looking at a two-dimensional image, we can usually just see out of one eye and get an idea of, of what depth and scale are like in that, that picture. Like if we're looking at a painting, we can get an idea of what the depth is like. Like, okay, these... Um, if there are like a lot of people in the painting, then these people up close are supposed to, you know, these are supposed to be people that are closer to the vantage point of the observer. The people in the back, because of shading and whatnot and size, those are supposed to be like, you know, those are way far away from the person who's observing. Um, but some binocular cues, you know, it may be hard for you to have good depth perception if you are only able to see out of one eye. All right. Now on to some general terms. Detecting stimuli and processing. Subliminal messages. What are those? If you hear that, that is me taking a drink from my metal water bottle. So I have posted a video about subliminal messages under chapter four materials. Uh, for an extra credit question. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, so that will be on the exam. Um, but a subliminal message is something that is supposed to be shown at, shown or presented, rather, I should say presented, presented right below the level of conscious awareness to a person. Um, so supposedly there's been a lot of, um, a lot of like stories about how, not supposedly, there are a lot of stories about how advertisers use subliminal messages. So there'll be a commercial or rather there'll be like a TV show and you see like an image of something that they're trying to convince you of or something that they're trying to sell you. So you may see like an image of McDonald's fries like for a fraction of a second. Enough to be like, did I actually see that? Or even not enough, not long enough for you to even know you saw it. But Supposedly, it flashes to your conscious awareness just long enough that it's going to stick and like implant a seed. So now we're just like these mindless drones who are just going to, you know, do this person's bidding or buy the product because we saw a tiny flash of some McDonald's french fries. Um, also, there are lots of of uh, stories about sublim subliminal messages in songs where it's like the artist is trying to tell somebody to do something sinister. It's 
really just mostly nonsense. Most of the stories out there are just complete nonsense. Um, and this video clip that I've posted is also nonsense, uh, but fun. So go check it out. All right. And then there is a thing called in inattentional blindness. Uh, so that is a failure to see fully visible objects or events because your attention is focused elsewhere. Um, so again, it's like, it's like something could be happening right in front of you and you don't see it because you're just not paying attention. You're just like so engrossed, enveloped, just fixated on whatever it is that you're doing and you don't know what's going on around you or right in front of you. This happens a lot to folks when we are on our phones. If we are really into whatever it is that's going on on our phone, maybe we're watching a, a video about some fluffy kittens, which I tend to do a lot of, <laughs> or, you know, we're reading something that's like important or just like really interesting to us, then we may not hear somebody like talking around us. Um, if you're at work and you're just like really like focused, you're in the zone, you're doing your thing, you may not hear what like a coworker is trying to say to you. Or the opposite could happen. Maybe you're really engrossed in a conversation with a coworker and like the phone's ringing or something and you totally like miss it because that's not where your attention is. There is, excuse me, there's also a cool video about inattentional blindness under the chapter four materials. Um, try not to like read the description or anything when you watch it, just watch it. Just click the link and watch the video and see if you fall for it because I definitely did the first time I saw the video. All right, and then a couple of other general terms are bottom up versus top down processing. So what bottom up processing means is that you take information from your senses and you make a, a full complete picture. Like you make a determination of what's going on or like a description of your experience based on all of those pieces of information. Top down processing is when you use previous experience to determine what's going on. So for instance, if you are in a classroom and you hear like a loud, a loud smack, like a big like smack against the floor. So you're sitting there in the classroom and all you hear is just that loud booming noise. You don't know what it is. So you may react to it. Like you may like duck or you look around, you like look towards the exit, like you're ready to like flee or to fight somebody, do something. So that would be an example of bottom up processing because you're just like looking to your sensory input. Top down processing on the other hand, would be, okay, so maybe you're in a classroom and you hear that loud noise, but you know from experience that you have dropped a textbook on a classroom floor before and it makes a loud, hideous sound. So based on that experience, you maybe look around to see, like, did somebody drop something? So it's less of an alarm state and it's more of, oh, okay, what's, what's happening? Like, I'm in a, a class and this is maybe a familiar sound. So top-down processing is just when you use other similar experiences that you've had in your life to make sense of, of the world around you and what's going on around you. All right. Gestalt psychology uh, is a like subdivision of sensation and perception. Uh, gestalt means form or shape. Gestalt psychology just in its kind of most simplistic way or, or terms or way of describing it says that we organize sensory information in predictable ways. So it looks for patterns in the way we come to our conclusions and perceive the information we get from the world around us that is coming into our sensory organs. A perceptual set is the way we put together information or says that the way we put together information is influenced by culture, experiences, beliefs, expectations, etc. So kind of like an even more like nuanced way of explaining top-down processing. So a perceptual set is just a kind of predictable pattern way of thinking about something based on all of these things, our culture, our experiences, our beliefs, our expectations, etc. Here is a chart of Gestalt principles. I do not expect you to remember all of them, um, but there may be a question from this list 
in the exam. So please see your study guide for more information. I'll leave this up here for a few seconds, or you could always pause the video, um, but I'm not going to go over them one by one. Again, Gestalt psychology and Gestalt principles just look at pattern ways we interpret visual, auditory, and you know other stimuli that comes into our sense organs. And it's not dissimilar to other um, other areas of psychology because in general psychology is the study of behavior and we look for patterned ways that people behave in given circumstances. So Gestalt just is more specific to sensation and perception. All right, now let's talk about hearing. So we're going to look at features and functions of the ear and auditory perception. So just like we had two theories of color perception when we talked about the eye just a few moments ago, we do have a couple of theories about how we kind of make sense of the information that we hear. All right, so here is a diagram of the ear. It gives you the three basic parts of the ear or the basic sections. Uh, so just like we have like three basic parts of the brain, we have the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. We've got a very similar setup for the ear. So we've got the external ear. So we've got this, this green part in the diagram is what we have outside of the ear and then going into the ear. And then we have the middle ear in this like purplish blue color. And then we have the internal ear in orange. So for the outer ear, we have the pinna. And then we have the auditory canal. So the pinna is just like the funnel, basically. It's this like outermost part of the ear. So the part that is external, the part that's like sticking out on our heads. So that is the pinna. And then we have the auditory canal here. So we've basically got funnels on the sides of our heads. And then it, it so it's like the big wide part of the funnel on the exterior part of our heads. And then it, you know, goes into the, the little tube part. So auditory canal. We also have the eardrum, which is considered to be part of the outer ear. It vibrates in response to sound waves. So we'll have a, a better diagram shortly, but um, the eardrum is here. And then we go into the middle part of the ear. All right, so for the middle ear, we have a few different um, different components or structures. So we have the ossicles, which are just a set of tiny bones. So we've got three key players here. We have the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. These amplify tiny changes in air pressure. So here, so here we have the eardrum. So looks like the outer part of a funnel, right? Or like a phonograph, if you even know what that is. Um, so it detects vibrations in here. And then from the eardrum, it, it's kind of like a game of like ping, um, of uh, pinball. Sorry, I was gonna say ping pong. I don't know why. Uh, pinball. So we've got vibrations that just kind of bounce around in these parts. Um, so we've got hammer, anvil, stirrup. And these get like amplified or kind of like blown up so that we can make better sense of them. So like these tiny little bones actually make these sounds bigger than when they originally entered the ear. So we've got the auditory canal or the auditory tube. Um, and then we have our eardrum right here and these little bones of the middle ear here. All right, now we have the inner ear. So the cochlea is the important structure here. It is fluid filled and it's a coiled tunnel containing auditory receptor cells. The basilar membrane is a neural tissue containing hair cells. So we've got this snail shaped thing here, the cochlea. It also looks like the little, the little seashell where like Ursula captures Ariel's voice. <laughs> That's what I always think of when I see this. So we've got the cochlea. And then along it, we have this like strip. We have a strip that coils through the cochlea, um, which is the basilar membrane. So it's a strip of hair coiled into a structure in our ear, which is really gross if you think about it. 
Um, but these little hairs are the receptor cells. They're the things that pick up auditory information. All right, so on to our theories of auditory perception. So we've got the temporal theory, which says that perception of pitch, so how high or low something sounds to us, corresponds to activity level of, of sensory neurons in the cochlea. So it's just like, are the hairs in our cochlea like stimulated like barely? Or are they like highly stimulated? So if they're barely stimulated, then the sound is going to be like low. It's going to have like a lot of bass. And if it's like, if the hair, if the hair cells are stimulated a lot, then that means the, the sound is going to be high in pitch. So here we have a diagram of what this would, um, of what this would look like. Actually, not really temporal theory. This is actually the next one, place theory. So for place theory, this says that different parts of the basilar membrane respond to different frequencies. So if something stimulates over here in this like base part, then it's going to be much higher in pitch. If it stimulates closer to the inner part of the coil, then it's going to be very low in pitch. So, which of these is correct? Again, the answer to all of these questions is both. Um, sometimes neither, but in this case, both. So, it depends on processing of the information. So, at lower levels of processing, we would we would go to the temporal theory and then for higher levels of processing, we go to place theory. So temporal theory kind of happens first and then place theory happens later so that we can kind of more fine tune what it is that we are experiencing as far as auditory stimulation, auditory um, stimuli. All right, now on to the other senses. So we've got olfaction and gustation, which are both very funny words. So I've put here things that are visually appealing, at least both to me, <laughs> and also appeal to our sense of olfaction. So olfaction is a sense of smell. Gustation is a sense of taste. So this bottom one, this delicious looking pizza, would appeal to both olfaction and gustation. So olfaction and gustation are very um, intricately tied. They are just in proximity, also very close to each other. Uh, I suppose our eyes and our ears are pretty close to each other too. Um, but usually if we can't smell anything, chances are we can't taste anything and vice versa. So what are the sensory receptors involved in gustation called? So if we've got a sense of taste, what helps us detect different flavors? Those would be our taste buds. Oop, went a little too fast. So those would be our taste buds. That may seem like a super common sense answer, um, but our taste buds are the sensory receptors that are involved in gustation. So they help get information into our filter and then we make sense of it. So then we start to actually go into the perception part. So how do we feel about it? Um, what are the different types of flavors that are in the food that we're consuming? Um, we also link that together with things like texture. So some foods people don't like, it's not really that they don't taste great, it's just that they really don't like the texture. Um, I know I've said it before with certain things like I don't like cheesecake, I don't like pumpkin pie, um, I'm going to try pumpkin pie again this season, but we'll see. Um, but sometimes, you know, it comes down to a texture thing. You, you may say that yourself or you may hear other people say it like, oh, for me, it's a texture thing. Um, so we have those things that are linked to each other because if we are chewing it, we are tasting it and we're also dealing with the texture. So all of these sources of sensory information work together for us to perceive what it is that we're experiencing to make sense of it. All right. Thank you all for tuning in.